excuse me, please step forward. Thank you, Mayor. Always um, good to see you. Thank you, and it's, and it's Debbie. Um, you know, I'm going to um, address real quickly this uh, utility cell. And this has been an issue, and, and Councilman Kramer is correct, this has been going on for many years, not just the last three years. This has been going on probably since 2007. And um, and the comment that the attorney made about uh, FMPA uh, is absolutely correct. This, in the beginning, FMPA did not want to be part of this contract negotiation in the beginning because they said it was a contract that was between the city and F FPL. So in the very beginning, FMPA said they didn't think it was appropriate to be part of the contract negotiation because um, the contract was between F FPL and the city. Um, when in reality, they have been the key part of this whole transaction. FMPA, from the very beginning, could either help make this work or they could kill the deal. And they have been in the process for the last seven years to kill the deal. There is no surprises, and I had a discussion with them in my office this past session about it. And, um, you know, in, in my view, FPL has come up with an agreement or a proposal. It's not an agreement, it's a proposal. And any support that the council can give FPL with FMPA and it will be would go a long way. The reason this is being drug out is because there's people that want the deal done and there's people that don't want the deal done. And there's there's no secret about that. There's sixty percent of the residents that live outside the city of Vero Beach that has been an advocate of this process for since two thousand seven. And there's a couple of them sitting in this off in this audience that have stuck it out that long. The longer you drag it out, the more it's going to cost. And that cost is no, one, no one's fault except for FMPA's fault. So when people criticize and say that the rates are going up, the longer we pay these attorneys, the longer we drag this out, the rates are going to go up. That's true because the cost is going to go up. So anything that the city council can do to encourage, because your contract is with FMPA, which is beyond me because they are a quasi-government entity that has no oversight except for the people that has a financial interest in them staying in existence. So when we say taxation without representation, that's exactly what it is because the decisions that they're making, they're making for their own personal reason to stay in existence. The other people out there that are, that are not part of electing them are the ones that are losing out. So, you know, I would just encourage that everyone get together and try to make this deal work so it doesn't drag out any longer. And FPL, I think, has done a great job in overcoming all the boundaries that FMPA has put in front of them in order to make this deal fail. So, the Mayor, that's, you guys have done a phenomenal job to keep this in front. And I would just hate to see us go backwards when we're so close to a good plan being negotiated out for all the ratepayers in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Are there any other more comments? Mayor, really quickly, there were a number of people in the um, from the community who planned on speaking specifically on this issue, and they wanted to speak a little bit uh, to what uh, our first speaker spoke on. Um, would it be possible to let them come up? A number of them do have to get back to their offices. Uh, if the council has no objection, we, we've got two presentations. I mean, they're waiting too. Uh, if we just stick to the agenda, you're not going to have any arguments. Okay, I'll agree with that. Stick to the uh, the agenda, uh, Mr. Brian Lapointe. Good morning to you. Good thanks morning. for your patience. Good morning, uh, and thanks for the invitation to come here today and uh, present some information <laughs> to you on our research. Um, I'd first like to thank my assistant, Laura Heron, who uh, is on the front page of the Press Journal today. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. The title, Killer Lagoon Toxins, uh, which is an update on our research on the health of the lagoon. Uh, I'll touch on that towards the end of my talk today. Now, the talk is uh, an update of a talk I gave back in March at Commissioner uh, Tim Zork's 
Indian River Lagoon uh, workshop. And this is going to include a little bit more information in it. Um, it's going to be a little bit technical. It's got a lot of kind of scientific data that I'm going to walk you through and interpret um, what these data mean. Now, I've been working with Harbor Branch for a long time. My research on the Indian River Lagoon really just began a couple of years ago with this particular research. A lot of my work on nutrients and water quality has uh, focused uh, on other areas in South Florida, Sarasota Bay, the Florida Keys, uh, Florida Bay. And what we've learned, we've learned a lot uh, over uh, the time period I've been doing this work about the, uh, the health of our coastal waters, in particular how they're affected by nutrient pollution. And uh, because of the work I was doing in the Florida Keys and around the Caribbean, I was asked by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences to help write this book on clean coastal waters, understanding and reducing the effects of nutrient pollution. And what we're talking about here today as it relates to the Indian River is this fundamental problem of nitrogen and phosphorus coming into our coastal waters from things that we do on land, okay? Um, this problem has been recognized by the Pew Oceans Trust in their 2003 report on the status of our nation's coastal waters and the following year by the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy that found it the most pervasive <coughs> and troubling problem facing U.S. coastal waters. So if we look at the Indian River Lagoon, this problem has not um, developed overnight. Um, we, we know over uh, many decades that the land use on the watersheds of the IRL has changed. We now have upwards of 40% uh, urban urbanization on the watershed, about 25% uh, agriculture, relatively small percentages of uh, wetlands, you know, and, and forest um, compared to these kind of human-dominated land uses. What this has done is brought in increased nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, into the lagoon, and it's, um, it's created a problem we call eutrophication as scientists. And this is, of course, these nutrients result in algal blooms, uh, low oxygen conditions, and also harmful algal blooms, toxins, that can be produced by some of the species of algae that are responding to these nutrients. And we've known that the Indian River Lagoon is quite susceptible to this eutrophication problem because of the low flushing nature, particularly in the northern reaches of the IRL that don't have as many inlets as the southern regions. And uh, based on a study back in 2007 um, by Suzanne Bricker with NOAA, we knew back then, given the moderate uh, to high nitrogen inputs and the problems we already saw, that algal blooms were likely to worsen. And I think you all know that is indeed the case. So when I began working uh, on this project uh, back in 2011, we wanted to really look at the vital signs up and down the Indian River Lagoon with respect to this nutrient problem and algal bloom problem. And first, I want to say this is one of the first studies really to address the health of the lagoon all the way from its northern extent at Ponce Inlet south to Jupiter Inlet. And for the first time, we wanted to have all these nutrient variables uh, documented in different areas because the problems in the IRL vary from place to place. And uh, what I'm going to do today is present to you the data that we've got in three samplings we've done in 2011 and 2012 at 20 sites up and down the IRL. Uh, these sites are spread quite evenly from the Mosquito Lagoon, the northern IRL, the Banana River, the central IRL, and the southern IRL. And we have a few reference sites also that are just outside the lagoon, okay, in our coastal waters. And at these sites, we went out and collected seawater that we measured nutrients in, nitrogen and phosphorus. We also collected the algae, because they can tell us a lot directly about the source of the nutrients. We have a uh, technique that uh, I've pioneered in Florida where we use stable nitrogen isotopes, the two forms of nitrogen in these algae, that can tell us if this 
nitrogen is from fertilizers or sewage or some other, say, natural source. So we, we did all this work, and of course the goal really is to provide information to managers and policymakers that's kind of user-friendly, that can kind of help guide decision-making going forward. Okay, the other thing I did uh, for the previous workshop to make this really relevant for us here in Indian River County is I'm going to break out the th three of the sites in the central Indian River Lagoon segment that we monitored are, are right here. Uh, one of our stations is at the mouth of the St. Sebastian <coughs> River. A second site is at the, uh, very close to the, the main relief canal mouth. A third site is near the South Canal, and we have a, a reference site there at Ambersand Worm, Worm Rock Reef. So as I present the overview of the data, we're going to have little hash marks that show how Indian River County relates to what we found br more broadly in the IRL study. So what we did, of course, we went out, we've gone out three times now throughout the lagoon, collected the water, the algae. Uh, we bring it back into the lab where we process it at Harbor Branch for measuring both the dissolved nutrients and the, uh, the nutrients and the stable nitrogen isotopes in the algae. And so first, let me just show you the salinity data. As I mentioned, these nutrients are in fresh water coming into the lagoon. So what we see immediately with the salinity are differences lagoon-wide, highest salinities up in the Mosquito Lagoon. Now these, these graphs I'm going to be showing are all done in the same fashion. You can see the, the abbreviated names for the different segments. Mosquito Lagoon is ML, Banana River BR, the Northern IRL, NIRL, Central IRL, the CIRL, and the Southern IRL uh, over on the right. SIRL with the reference sites on the very far right. And the little yellow hash marks are the Indian River County averages. So you can see how those numbers here relate uh, both to the central IRL data and more broadly to all the data lagoon wide. So for salinity, for example, you see the Mosquito Lagoon, very confined, a lot of evaporation, not a as much fresh water input, we saw the highest salinities, for example, up there. The lowest salinities are right here in the central IRL, okay? And over the course of the study, going from the dry season in 2011 into uh, the wet season of 11, okay, that dry season was actually July of 2011. Uh, the wet sampling was in November of that year, and then the wet season 2012 was November uh, of 2012. And if you recall, we had an extended drought that, from about 2007 till about 2010, when actually conditions really improved in the Indian River Lagoon due to reduced runoff. Uh, the seagrasses were expanding, doing very well. But as you recall, uh, right about the time we began the study, we came out of that, that drought. We started uh, getting into our kind of normal rainfall patterns. And that's when we began to see, see problems emerge um, that I'll be talking about. But to come back to the salinity data, um, you can see, for example, in the central IRL, that first sampling in red, uh, 2011, the salinity was quite high, and then when we came back in the subsequent two samplings in the wet season, how that salinity went down. So that means, obviously, a lot of fresh water has been coming in to the IRL right here in Indian River County. If you look at the, um, the county data, you can see in the, in the dry season, the hash mark is actually above the average for, for the central IRL. But in the wet season, that first wet season, it was below. And that's water management, holding water in the dry season and releasing it more in the wet season. Okay, it creates patterns like that. You see on the very far right, the reference, the salinity is about 35 parts per thousand. That's typical oceanic salinity. So we have a lot of fresh water coming into the IRL here. Uh, not as much as the releases from Lake Okeechobee, okay, in the St. Lucie area, but uh, they weren't making releases during any of these samplings. So if we look at the amount of algae in the water, the chlorophyll A, what did we see? Well, <coughs> you can see very quickly the trend here is more chlorophyll as you move from south to north. Uh, in the summer sampling uh, of 2011, that first dry 
uh, what we call a dry season, that was just when we were beginning to see a lot of rainfall, okay? This could have been, for example, a first flush event of nutrients coming into the lagoon with that increased rainfall. We saw the super bloom in the Banana River. That was the first time we saw a bloom of this magnitude in the Indian River Lagoon. And that was followed the following summer by the brown tide in the Mosquito Lagoon area, okay? You can see in the central IRL and to the south, uh, because of the greater flushing down here, the residence time of the water is shorter, and we tend not to get as much uh, phytoplankton in the water uh, as they do to the north. So the nutrients that are supporting the blooms, um, both of phytoplankton and these, these seaweeds or the benthic algae we're looking at, uh, one, one of the pools that's very important is what we call dissolved inorganic nitrogen. This is ammonia and nitrate, very reactive forms of nitrogen. Uh, it's found in sewage. These are also found in fertilizers. And once they're in the water, particularly <coughs> ammonium, that is the preferred source of nitrogen for algal blooms. Look uh, immediately, you look at this graph, and you can see in the central Indian River Lagoon, we have quite high uh, forms of nitrogen, these reactive forms. If you see the little dotted line, that's one micromolar. That's all these algae really need to form a bloom. And you can see how high um, all three samplings were relative to other areas. And also, if you look at the hash marks for Indian River County compared to the central IRL, you see actually in the dry season, we were lower, again, the idea of managers holding water but in that first wet season, you can see the nitrogen went off the chart here. Very, very high. And the point I want to make, when, when these reactive forms of nitrogen get this high, they can actually cause uh, die-off of things like seagrass as they can become toxic under very high concentrations, for example, of ammonia, particularly uh, with warm temperatures, the, the synergistic effects of high nitrogen and high temperatures we know is a big stress for seagrasses. Uh, phosphorus, uh, you can see pretty much the same pattern as we just saw with nitrogen. Very high phosphorus in the central IRL. Again, this is soluble reactive phosphorus, the most reactive form of phosphorus. These algae need both nitrogen and phosphorus to form blooms. And we see again in the uh, in the second sampling, how actually those values were, were kind of off the chart here, high. Uh, this total dissolved nitrogen is a, a, the larger pool of nitrogen, and it includes what we call dissolved organic nitrogen, which is the form of nitrogen that supports brown tides. And it, interestingly, you can see how uh, that increases going from south to north, <coughs> quite high concentrations in the Banana River, uh, Mosquito Lagoon in the northern IRL. So it, it looks like this form of nitrogen may be building up in the lagoon because of the long residence time of water in the north compared to the south. You can see the IRL target there of 50 micromolar for total uh, dissolved nitrogen. You can see pretty much from the central IRL north we're over that target, meaning uh, this is uh, uh, indication that we would like to see these concentrations go down to control these algal blooms. Total dissolved phosphorus, um, you can see, as we saw earlier with the soluble reactive phosphorus, it too is very high here in the central IRL, likely being delivered with the fresh water, uh, the, the lower, those lower salinities that we saw here. Uh, the, the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus is also important to the types of algae that bloom and also to the development of toxins in the algae. Okay, Here you see a pattern, very clear, uh, increasing nitrogen to phosphorus ratios as you go from south to north in the lagoon. Values above about 30 indicate phosphorus limitation values under 30 nitrogen limitation of these algal blooms. So that strong phosphorus limitation in the northern part of the IRL is due to the nitrogen buildup that's occurring. The algae grow, they exhaust the phosphorus, and we think this is maybe one of the key factors that's leading to toxin production up there. When these algae grow, they bloom, then they become phosphorus limited. That's when, in many cases, they begin producing toxins. 
Uh, the algae that we sampled uh, for the stable nitrogen isotopes, uh, these are just some of the, the various species that are common bloom formers in the Indian River Lagoon. The one on the top left, Grassleria tikvahi, that is the seaweed that's eaten by the manatees as they've lost their food source, the seagrasses. They have switched their diet to this bloom-forming alga that uh, forms thick mats uh, uh, in the Indian River Lagoon. And this is uh, what I'll talk about in a minute that we sampled uh, about a month ago uh, to look for toxins. Okay, we can look at the nutrients actually in the algae to see how they're responding to the water nutrients that I just presented. This is the carbon-nitrogen ratio in the algae themselves. And that value of 12 you see there, we know when the, this ratio gets above that, the algae become limited by nitrogen, meaning their growth rate slows down. And as I mentioned, they could begin producing toxins uh, under those scenarios. Well, if, if you look at the Banana River, for example, you see quite high C to N ratios. That's where that grass area came from that we've documented toxins, okay. Uh, we see the central IRL has fairly low C to N ratios. So in that case, those particular algae have a lot of nitrogen, and that's not surprising given the low salinity and the high uh, ammonia and nitrate that uh, we found at those sites. The carbon to phosphorus ratio, as we saw in the seawater, we see a trend of increasing ratios in the algae going from south to north. And I just want to point out, look at the really high value there uh, for the wet season sampling last year. That was during the brown tide, when that big, big bloom was stripping all the phosphorus out of the water. So the benthic seaweeds that we're sampling, you can see how phosphorus limited they became. And once again, again, those are the conditions that can induce toxin production. Nitrogen to phosphorus ratio, uh, similar trend, increasing values moving from south to north. Same effect there in the Mosquito Lagoon with the brown tide effect. Very, very high N to P ratios, high degree of phosphorus limitation. Okay, now this, this is the data set, I think, that probably is most interesting to to people here because this really relates to the source of the nitrogen supporting these algae blooms in the lagoon. And let me just walk you through what, what these data represent. Um, the stable nitrogen isotope, the unit there we call parts per mil, and this is basically the ratio of nitrogen 15 to nitrogen 14. Those are the two forms of nitrogen uh, on our planet. And by looking at that ratio, we can tell the source of the nitrogen, kind of like DNA <coughs> fingerprinting. Um, atmospheric nitrogen has a value of about zero, okay? Now, fertilizers, because they're made from atmospheric nitrogen, are very close to zero. They can range up to perhaps plus two parts per mil, okay? And the rule of thumb we use uh, in the studies of isotopes when we look at uh, food web structure, you are what you eat plus two parts per mil. So for example, a human, uh, say, feeding on a plant, say a vegetarian that's eating plants grown on fertilizers, if that fertilizer signature was plus one, the waste from that human would be about plus three, okay, plus two parts per mil over the source signature. And so what we find, and this is based on a wide number of studies done by many, many scientists around the world, is that when you get up to a value of about plus three, that you begin to get in the, the wastewater range, okay, of human sewage. It starts there and it can go up from there depending on the degree of, say, treatment of wastewater. Typically, Septic tank effluent has values of about plus three to plus four or so. And uh, as that nitrogen gets into the groundwater and migrates through the groundwater or in a surface water, a tributary or a canal, you get uh, bacteriological processes, nitrification, <coughs> denitrification, that can then what we call fractionate and, and move that value up to higher values. And that happens in a sewage treatment plant as well. It may come in at plus three parts per mil, but uh, coming out of that plant, the ammonium, the nitrate, 
uh, in that effluent can be up, say, plus six parts per mil or plus nine parts per mil. So when you look at these data for the Indian River Lagoon, you go, gee, um, this looks like values you would expect to see in a, at the end of the pipe in a sewage treatment plant, okay? And I say that because I've used this technique in many, many, many different settings, and these are quite high values, typical, and we'll see this in a minute, of what we find in, in sewage-polluted systems. Uh, if you look at the central IRL, once again, you saw we had a lot of fresh water coming in. Look how high the values are in the central Indian River Lagoon. In particular, Indian River County, that hash mark in our last sampling is one of the highest values we got uh, throughout the lagoon. This is just for comparison's sake. Um, here's the Indian River Lagoon, Florida, shown in red. Comparing that with other uh, areas that we know are heavily impacted by sewage nitrogen. Roberts Bay, Florida, that's one segment of Sarasota Bay. It's tens of thousands <coughs> of septic tanks on it coming down Philippi Creek. Um, if you go over to the right side of this plot, you see Sarasota Bay. That's the bay-wide average. Uh, getting down closer to three, not quite as high. In fact, there are segments in Sarasota Bay that are below three, the very cleanest areas of Sarasota Bay. Uh, Boston Harbor, uh, the values reported there, uh, well-known sewage polluted harbor, you can see is neck and neck with the average for the Indian River Lagoon. Um, the Quashnet River Mass, some of my colleagues at Woods Hole Oceanographic have done extensive studies of many of the estuaries on Cape Cod that rely on septic tanks. Um, you can see those values are up there as well. Big Pine Key, uh, the Florida Keys, as you know, has had serious issues with septic tanks. Um, those are the values in those canals. It's actually a fecal coliform from septic tanks, from sewage in the Florida Keys. That is a pathogen that killed all the Elkhorn coral, most of it in the Florida Keys, okay? This is kind of a new to science thing, but we have discovered that as scientists just in the past <clears throat> few years. Western Florida Bay, the far right, I just wanted to point out, fertilizers obviously can also contribute nutrients that contribute to these algal blooms. Florida Bay has gone through many of the problems we're seeing in the Indian River Lagoon. 100,000 acres of seagrass was lost in the late 80s and early 90s as more and more water came in from the Everglades, high nitrogen water from agricultural sources, fertilizers, topsoil nitrogen. These blooms were devastating to the bay and the reefs. But look at the value, values down below three. That's in the range of fertilizer nitrogen. So you have to really look at all these sources, sewage, fertilizers, they all can contribute to this problem. Well, after seeing the data, we, we of course, um, realized that we, we have a real issue here with septic tanks uh, on the Indian River Lagoon. And uh, about the time we were um, looking at what to do next, uh, a student appeared in my laboratory that really wanted to work on this problem. So we are just beginning a project, and this is in collaboration with the county, with Cheryl Dunn, the uh, Department of Health, we're going to be looking at the St. Sebastian River, four sub-watersheds in Indian River County. The St. Sebastian River system, the North Canal, Main Reef Relief Canal, and the South Canal. <coughs> We're going to be doing a lot of different uh, measurements in this study, as you can see on the right, um, of a number of different tracers of human waste. Not just the stable nitrogen isotope, but... Uh, caprostanol, a fecal sterile that builds up in the sediments. Uh, it's really a better, better uh, variable, say, than fecal coliform bacteria because it builds up. It doesn't go away. Um, we're also looking at optical brighteners that are used in, in laundry detergents. So that, that study is really just starting to get rolling now. Um, now, I know there's a lot of doom and gloom here today, uh, particularly in this talk as it relates to the IRL. But I do want to say this problem can be turned around, and it has been turned around in Tampa Bay. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of South Florida, and when I went there uh, in the late 70s, Tampa Bay was a mess. Uh, a lot of the problems we see in the Indian River Lagoon were being manifest. Um, and again, it followed decades of urbanization, 
Algal blooms had developed uh, as a result of the nutrient inputs. Seagrasses were dying out. Uh, severe algal blooms, particularly macroalgae, that were rotting, causing odor problems. And that was the trigger for the public, the odor problems. Uh, some of the big houses there on Hillsborough Bay, those owners didn't like smelling these severe hydrogen sulfide odors uh, emanating from the bay, particularly at low tide. So that led to the Grizzle Fig Act that required advanced waste treatment from sewage back in, in the late 70s and early 80s. And it was the removal of nitrogen in that particular system because there's a lot of phosphorus in that water over there naturally and, and due to the, the mining operations. But 90% of the wastewater nitrogen was removed going into the bay uh, through the Grizzle Fig Act and other, other attempts to control urban, industrial, and agricultural stormwater coming into the bay. So the good news is they've already, by nutrient reduction, have led to 8,000 acres of seagrasses that have recovered in the bay. <clears throat> and the goal is to get back to the 1950s acreage of seagrasses, and they need to get 10,000 more acres to, to get to that point. And th this is a classic example of where science is integrated with management to make good things happen. And these are the steps that they took in the Tampa Bay Estuary Program with their partners to set specific seagrass goals of what they want to restore. And in this case, 38,000 acres is the total acreage they wanted to achieve. They determined the light requirements of the seagrasses because the more algae in the water, the less light to the seagrasses. It's one of the major factors causing the seagrass decline. Determine the water clarity levels necessary to provide that light to meet the seagrass acreage goals. And then determining the chlorophyll A concentrations that allows that water clarity to be, to be maintained. Uh, and then look at the, the relationship. What are the maximum nutrient loadings that allow chlorophyll A targets to be achieved? And then implementing this nitrogen management strategy. And it's an iterative process of continuing to assess the effectiveness of this uh, nitrogen removal. So to just wrap up, um, we found in our study that both these reactive forms of nitrogen and phosphorus were at or above the threshold concentrations for the formation and maintenance of algal blooms in the Indian River Lagoon. The N to P ratio in the seawater and the algal tissue both showed the, this pattern of strong P limitation or phosphorus limitation in the northern IRL, Banana River, and the Mosquito Lagoon, and nitrogen limitation in the central IRL and to the south of us. And that very high DON concentrations and N to P ratios uh, in the northern areas support these brown tides that we're seeing now, uh, as well as cyanobacterial blooms. And those high N to P ratios, as I mentioned, may be one of the factors that is leading to the toxin production, uh, by, particularly by the cyanobacteria. <coughs> These high stable nitrogen isotope values are clearly reflecting high wastewater nitrogen loading. And it may not just all be from septic tanks. There are other sources that need to be looked at as well. Um, the lowest salinity, highest reactive nitrogen phosphorus and N15 values were all found right here in Indian River County. And I just wanted uh, to show you this. These are the, the uh, recent results of these toxicity assays. Uh, these are from extracts of the Gracilaria seaweed that had these thick coatings of epiphytes, other types of algae and bacteria that under these high nutrient conditions foul these seaweeds uh, in the IRL. And if you look at the methanol extract line in the middle, uh, you can see the yellow colors indicate cell death, very active toxins. This is a, a mammalian assay, meaning these toxins will, will kill ma mammal cells. So um, I just want to thank a, a number of people for working and uh, collaborating with me. Uh, Dr. Peter Moeller at the NOAA lab in Charleston has been doing the, the toxicity. Uh, screening on on these seaweeds. We've been sending them, but a lot of people have, have helped to make this happen. 
And I just want to close saying, I think I've got like the dirtiest job in America. This is um, a photo one of my students took. Uh, this is the Delray outfall. And we've used these same techniques looking at this, the impact of the sewage outfalls between Miami-Dade and Palm Beach County. And it was back in 2007, 2008, that legislation was drafted by DEP and many contributed to this once we had the stable nitrogen isotope data. So if you look at the utility permits and, uh, you know, <laughs> they thought all the sewage was like being carried away by the Gulf Stream, you know. But it was obviously building up in our, in our coastal waters and following the nest. So anyway, with that, uh, the good news is this particular outfall is already closed down. And there are plans to uh, phase out the other outfalls as they go to more higher levels of treatment, AWT, and reuse of that water. So with that, I just want to thank you for hanging in there. Thank you, Mr. LaPointe. Are there any questions for Mr. Yeah, LaPointe? Yeah, uh, Dr. LaPointe. Uh, the uh, act you referred to, Griswold, I didn't get it. Grizzle fig. What was it specifically? Well, it was uh, uh, an act that called for mandatory nitrogen removal from sewage. Uh, only on the West Coast, though. It's geographically bound. I think the, the area was from Tampa Bay south to Charlotte Harbor. So it, it doesn't affect this coast or other, other parts of Florida. But I think the reason they focused on that area because they have such high background phosphorus concentrations, <coughs> adding a little bit of nitrogen in that high phosphorus is like in putting fuel on the fire. So. Mayor, well, I have you. a question. Yes. Uh, Dr. Point, you stated that we are at or above the threshold concentrations for the formation of microalgal blooms in the Inner River Lagoon. Are you saying that right now we're on a precipice that we may see imminently algal blooms, brown tides taking place within our area? In the, in the Indian River County area? Mm -hmm. uh, we already have blooms of macroalgae here. Now, we haven't seen the brown tides yet, okay? The brown tide organism likes those high end to P ratios that are up in the Mosquito Lagoon right okay. now. And it also, we think, likes the high salinity. So salinity can determine what species bloom. You've got to have the nutrients, though, to support that biomass. So it may be a different alga that might bloom. And I, I've heard some reports of blooms recently in the Indian River County area. Uh, we haven't been out there. I think you know we had a, a, legis a request to purchase these Lobos, mm -hmm. which this is seasonal sampling where we go out every six months or so. Uh, those lobos, we needed those to be able to track real time the dynamics, uh, the blooms, the nutrients coming in and going, and the salinity. Uh, as you know, the governor vetoed that request, so we don't, we aren't going to have those uh, to support our work. But we do have a NSF uh, proposal pending that might uh, get three of those uh, hopefully in the near future. And what is, why did you request equipment that was Canadian made when certainly there are American <laughs> made, comparable American made equipment that they're, would do it? They're actually American made. Most of the components are American made. It's a Canadian company that actually put the components together. But yeah, that's. May, may have helped with your legislation. <laughs> well, it wouldn't help the science, though. These, these are the, the gold standard, the Lobos. Uh, we, we've been using one of those instruments for years in my lab. And it's, it's, um, it's got a long, proven track record of performance. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. LaPointe. I'm sorry, one more, another question, sir. Based on your data, though, you're saying definitively that the fertilizer issue that we have tried with fertilizer um, uh, rules and, and, and placement of rules on the individuals applying fertilizer are not actually the problem. Based on your science, we're seeing that it's sewage treatment nitrogen that is causing the yeah, issues that we're well, seeing right now. No, th that's not really what I said. <laughs> um, if, we, if we back up, let me back this up a little few slides here. Really both those nitrogen sources need to be reduced. Um, if we go back to the N15 slide, this right. slide here. Now these values <laughs> are reflecting sewage nitrogen. They're in the range we often see. But if we didn't have fertilizer nitrogen come in, these could actually be higher, okay? So when you have multiple nitrogen sources coming in, okay, um, 
it can tilt the balance. So if we go, for example, the next slide, mm -hmm. look at Florida Bay, the bulk of the nitrogen in Florida Bay is fertilizer nitrogen coming from agriculture. You see its value on the very right hand side is down below three. Now that doesn't necessarily mean there's no sewage in Florida Bay either, but it is the sewage, uh, the fertilizer nitrogen is the dominant form of nitrogen. Okay, so the bottom line is you've got to really go after all the sources okay. of nitrogen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaPointe. Ms. Adams? <clears throat> Sorry. Good afternoon, Council Mayor. Thank you for inviting me up here the, this morning to uh, do a little presentation about Main Street and hopefully uh, shed some light on what it is we do and what we're about. Who is Main Street? Main Street, we're a group of interested professionals, property and business owners, government officials, residents, and a board of directors that support a return to the community self-reliance by emphasizing downtown's assets of personal service, local ownership, unique architecture, and the arts. <coughs> She's not next. She's not, uh, oh, yes, uh, not working. Uh, no, I think it's on. Pouring it out today. <laughs> Battery low. Warm out. Mm -mm. We have your copy up here. Why don't you just go ahead and walk through it and we'll follow you on these copies we have up here. Okay. Who is Main Street? Well, we all work together to create a sense of community and make downtown Vero Beach an attractive place to work, shop, live, and play. Since 1995, Main Street Vero Beach has been a member of the National Main Street Center, which is a subsidiary of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And also since 1998, Main Street Vero Beach has been an official Florida Main Street program through the Florida Department of State Division of Historical Resources. Here are our affiliations and what that means to us and what they provide. A, a proven strategy for revitalization, a powerful network of linked communities, and a valuable guidance system and established programs that lead the field. Why should we revitalize downtown? Primarily, it builds positive community image. It reflects confidence in the future. It creates job opportunities. It attracts new business and industry. It saves, stabilizes, and improves tax dollars. It protects current downtown investments, and it preserves our historic resources and heritage. The Main Street approach in action nationally has spanned three decades. Locally, we've spanned 15 years. Nationally, it's taken root in more than 2,000 communities, and it has definitely taken root here in our historic downtown community. Nationally, it's spurred $49 billion in reinvested, reinvestment in traditional commercial districts. And here locally, it's spurned $11.4 million in reinvestment in the downtown Main Street District. It's galvanized thousands of volunteers nationally and hundreds of volunteers here locally that have resulted in 4,159 volunteer hours. 
and it has changed the way that government planners, governments and planners and developers view preservation. And locally, we've worked with the city and county governments, local planners and developers, property and business owners to build consensus and cooperation for revitalization among the various stakeholders downtown. So here's some stats. This is kind of interesting. And these national estimates that we'll start off with are from 1980 through December of last year. $55.7 billion dollars have been reinvested in Main Street communities across the nation. It's resulted in 109,664 net gains in businesses in those communities, 473,439 net gain in jobs, 236,201 building rehabilitations, Equaling for one dollar, every dollar invested nationally, 18 is returned in reinvestment. Now, how does that equate to us locally? Our estimates are from our inception as a Main Street program in 1998 through December of last year. We have received $11.4 million reinvested in the community, 57 net gain in businesses, 133 net gain in jobs, 48 building rehabilitations, and this is in our little downtown area, which means every dollar that's been invested in our downtown area, we've returned back $8. This four-part approach that's used by all Main Streets, what's it about? It's organization, promotion, design, and economic restructuring, and it's what every Main Street runs by. It's the foundation for all local initiatives to revitalize their districts by leveraging local assets from historic, cultural, or architectural heritage to local enterprises and community pride. It's a comprehensive strategy that addresses the variety of issues and problems that challenge traditional commercial, commercial districts. And the four-point approach, they work together to build a sustainable and complete community revitalization effort and coincidentally correspond to the four forces of real estate value, which are social, political, physical, and economic. It's a very well-oiled machine. It's been working since 1980. So what is organization and how does that relate to how we operate? Organization establishes consensus and cooperation by building partnerships among the various groups that have a stake in our downtown commercial district. By getting everyone working towards the same goal, our Main Street Vero Beach program has provided effective ongoing management and advocacy for historic downtown and our neighborhood business district. So what have we achieved? We participated in the Vero Beach's Vision Plans implementation team in 2005, working with city staff, community leaders, business and property owners, planners, developers, and local citizens to establish timelines and strategies for implementing the vision plan recommendations for downtown Vero Beach. We partnered with the Land Design South in two, July 2006 to prepare the downtown action plan that was commissioned by the city. We funded and worked with Ramon Trias, helping present to the public at the community center a Route 60 twin pairs charrette in September 2005 and a downtown charrette in September 2006. And we supported the creation of a business improvement district and are currently spearheading business and property owners from all corners of the district to create the bylaws and set up governance and brainstorm a list of ideas for capital improvements. And this BID was established under Ordinance 2012-07, was adopted by the city here on <coughs> May 15th, 2012. So what are our goals from an organizational aspect? We're going to work with city planning and development staff on the white paper that will propose an amendment to the comprehensive plan that will incorporate including an objective and supporting policies for the downtown with data and analysis using as a starting goals, as a basis. The 2010 Evaluation Appraisal Report, or EAR report, documented that addressed the downtown action plan and other issues affecting the downtown and was adopted by the city council. 
And also, we plan to, within the requirements of the Economic Development Zone Ordinance, work with the Ad Hoc Steering Committee towards the designation and implementation of the city's first business improvement district for the implementation by September 2013. And after implementation, we plan on working with the city and the BID Board of Directors toward actualization of the BID-defined capital improvement projects. Promotion, the second part of a Main Street approach. Promotion, of course, it's many forms. It helps create a positive image that rekindles community pride and improves consumer and investor confidence in the commercial district. Advertising and retail promotions, special events, marketing campaigns help sell the image of our downtown and the promise of Main Street to the community and surrounding region. Promotions communicate our downtown commercial district's unique characteristics, business establishments, and activities to shoppers, investors, potential business and property owners, and visitors. So what have we done so far? The annual Hibiscus Festival every April draws thousands of attendees from outside the area, artists, vendors, overnight guests, and brings entertainment to the downtown area, creating a destination event. Our Downtown Friday, on the last Friday of every month, from January to March and May to November along 14th Avenue, draws hundreds of attendees every month, outside vendors, and entertainment to the downtown area. We have a monthly Arts District Gallery stroll on the first Friday of every month that draws hundreds of visitors to the fine art galleries along 14th Avenue and dine in many of the restaurants downtown. We assisted the city with their 90th anniversary birthday celebration that took place downtown in October 2009. And working with the city, we created the downtown map in 2010 in partnership. So what are our goals? We have a lot planned in this area. We're going to be adding elements to the Hibiscus Festival that will result in more attendees and participants requiring overnight stays. We're going to revitalize our monthly Downtown Friday through collaborations and with downtown businesses and organizations by offering creative themes and special entertainment attractions to attract more and varied attendees. We're going to add new events and partner in other events and create a PR campaign to promote downtown as a destination spot highlighting its artistic, historic, and gastronomic features. We're going to work on a walking map app with the chamber to attract a larger demographic to downtown. We're going to create a brochure type postcard listing our events and our purpose for distribution to the hotels and motels and businesses in the area. We're going to ramp up our social media presence on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and revamp our website. We're going to create unique Main Street member meetings biannually that offer proven ideas, effective processes, creative programs, and more from our national and Florida Main Street experts and consultants. And we're going to put out there that we would be interested in hosting a quarterly, Florida Main Street quarterly meeting to bring other successful Main Streets, uh, their professionals and business owners and investors to the area. Design. Design means getting Main Street in top physical shape and creating a safe, inviting environment for shoppers, workers, and visitors. It takes advantage of the visual opportunities inherent in our downtown commercial district by directing attention to all of the physical elements, public and private buildings, storefronts, signs, public spaces, parking areas, street furniture, public art, landscaping, merchandising, window displays, and promotional materials. Design also means instilling good maintenance practices in the downtown commercial district, enhancing downtown's physical appearance through the rehabilitation of historic buildings, encouraging appropriate new construction, developing sensitive design management systems, educating business and property owners about design quality and long-term planning. So what have we done so far in design? 
We completed the pilot project of the prioritized streetscape improvements of the downtown action plan along 14th Avenue between 20th and 21st Streets that featured street lights, hanging flower baskets, planters, trash uh, receptacles, bump out landscape areas with trees, sidewalk enhancements uh, with pavers and benches. And we supported the lane reduction of State Road 60 twin pairs as proposed by the City of Vero Beach Vision Plan, MPO, and City of Vero Beach to ensure pedestrian safety and friendliness and help promote revitalization by joining back together the now split downtown area. And we partnered with the Brackett family on the renaissance of the theater plaza <coughs> facade. What are our goals? We want to establish a funding source for providing permanent, <coughs> mitig uh, uh, permanent um, irrigation. Oh, <laughs> permanent irrigation to the hanging baskets and planters in the pilot project area along 14th Avenue. Um, we're looking into a couple of options. Uh, currently, we do have one option from Nanette at the city that that's going to cost about $2,700 to $3,000. And before we can proceed to phase one of the, the streetscape design, we've got to mitigate and take care of, of addressing <coughs> plant materials and making them stay green on the, uh, the uh, pilot project area. So we're working on that. We're working with the city and 14th Avenue businesses on implementation of the phase one um, of that streetscape um, once we resolve the first option there on irrigation. And we're also going to offer Main Street members design ideas from National and Florida Main Street speakers that have decades of experience in the trenches knowledge and proven expertise um, on design that will work for us. Economic restructuring. That's the fourth and final area of the Main Street approach. Economic restructuring strengthens our community's existing economic assets while diversifying its economic base. This is accomplished by retaining and expanding successful businesses to provide a balanced commercial mix, sharpening the competitiveness and merchandising skills of business owners, and attracting new businesses that our market can support. Converting unused or underused commercial spaces into economically productive property also helps boost the profitability of downtown. The goal is to build a commercial district that responds to the needs of today's consumers. So our two primary accomplishments of economic restructuring have been we working with the city currently on establishing this economic development zone ordinance towards the purpose of promoting economic growth um, which can result in high wage jobs and help diversify the economy of the city. This is a totally separate entity from Main Street Vero Beach. The zone or business improvement district as we're referring to it, it'll be funded via incremental tax, which is the difference between the amount of property tax revenue generated before zone designation and then after zone designation by the city. <coughs> Only property taxes generated by the incremental tax increase in value of the economic development zone are, are, will be available for city approved projects. And the city does have to approve all projects by this group. And then we helped obtain the designation by the City of Vero Beach as an arts district, attracting more galleries and related businesses downtown. And we successfully lobbied for the traffic calming and adding additional parking on the Twin Pairs to create a more pedestrian-friendly environment. So our goals are to continue to work with the BID Board of Directors in the city uh, to successfully fund and implement <coughs> desired capital improvements and also offer useful and informative workshops and presentations by national Main Street consultants to our members and downtown business and property owners. And also to apply for grants for Main Street for implementation of the proposed downtown improvements. So in summary, support of Main Street is essential.
It's a broad-based support along with a balance of public and private participants and funding that's necessary for Main Street to succeed in its mission. Main Street Vero Beach relies on help from local residents, civic organizations, schools and other institutions, banks, utilities, media and more. It's absolutely essential that our Main Street Vero Beach program be as inclusive as possible with a broad and varied cross-section of the community committed to assisting and supporting the program. By working together, we can all bring people and commerce back to our treasured downtown. Give me your, give me your, give me your attention, baby. I gotta tell you a little something about. You filmed it at night. Play the one on the thing then. <laughs> give me your, give me your, give me your attention, baby. I gotta tell you a little something about yourself. Entirely downtown, uh, Dome Films it was a local, uh, a group of local students that filmed that downtown. So it truly is a treasure. Any questions, Miss Adams? Tammy, I believe uh, there's been how many thousand hits on that now? I, I believe it's up. I don't know. It's on YouTube. Five and, or ten thousand uh, hits, at least, at least. Yes. And it's it, and that took the participation of for closing down the roads yes, and, and the police out there so it took a lot um, of people to make that happen we really thank that we thank not only the work you guys do but also work that uh, a lot of people are doing in this community to promote our city and thank you very much for thank this you. update on everything going on at main street thank you thank, thank you yeah. tammy thank you thank, thank you, you very tammy. much we're going to take a break for lunch <coughs> we'll uh, reconvene here at one o'clock open up with public comment <laughs>